Welcome to the Layman Seminary. Today we're continuing our series on Sunday School preparation. And as you see, I'm actually in Sunday School teaching the class. I have my brother Miguel with me. He just uh, graduated right from high school. Yeah. And so he's working and doing all of that. This is the singles class now. It used to be called the College and Careers. Uh, but we've kind of diversified it even more so. So with that said, um, Miguel, do you mind opening this up for prayer? Just pray whatever comes on your mind. All right. Yeah. All right. Dear Lord, thank you for the day that you've given us. Uh, for every day that we wake up, I bless you, Lord. And thank you for allowing me to be here today, as I've been saying I would come and haven't. And finally, I've showed up. And thank you for Charlie being patient with everybody. And finally, somebody coming through to him. And hopefully, more people will start showing up to this class, Lord. You just know I pray. Amen. Amen. Wow, that's a good prayer. Um, thanks. It blessed me. Huh? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, last week, this, this outline is actually from last week, hmm. but because we're going into a new book, I'm going to go off of some of this and then add to the lesson for today. Um, Miguel, thank you for being our cameraman for today, you know. <laughs> um, but last week it was about don't be scattered brain. Okay? I mean... You just come out of high school. You just got a new yeah. job, right? Yeah. Just had uh, a move that occurred. Mm -hmm. And then your mom got sick. Yeah. Yeah. So, that, I mean, that's a lot to deal with, yeah. right? So, when you go into the book of James, you have this idea about asking for wisdom in the midst of trials. Okay? Um, many people... Let's start with this color here. Many people, whenever they read the book of James, they think it's either how to get saved, and they read everything like, oh, you got to lose your salvation, or, or you got to do this to be saved, right? Or other people will read it, and they will say, it's how do we prove that we're saved? In other words, a true Christian would do this, or a true Christian would do that. I actually think that it's more the idea of how to be useful for God, okay? So... I just want to mention that, that we're talking about being useful for God. Now, the reason I called it scattered brain, don't be scattered brain, is because, and you see in James chapter 1, he said he addresses this letter to the scattered tribes, talking about Israel. And, and last time I talked about all the historical reasons or different periods of time in which they were scattered and why they were scattered and all that. But the application point in all that is that uh, there are times when we are scattered by God. You know? There are times whenever we don't understand what's going on in our life. You know? And, 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 and we can get discouraged if we look at the situation. We can get depressed if we look at ourselves and think, man, I'm not doing enough. I'm not strong enough for this. Or, um, or we can look to God's word and find wisdom. And that's what this... Uh, book promises. You have this concept of perseverance. Where have you heard that word before? Hmm. Perseverance. You ever heard that word before? What would be hmm. a synonym of that or a word similar to that? Can you think of one? Hmm. How about this think. one? Endurance. Oh, yeah. What about that one? When, when hmm. have you heard that word used? Usually when there's a lot. Uh, trying to think. Like sports and yeah. things like that? Okay. Now, his, his, in history, I talked about this last time. There's been this doctrine called the perseverance of the saints. Okay? Mm. A doctrine is just a teaching. Oh, by the way, any questions or thoughts you have, be, uh, be uh, feel free to express them, okay? Because we'll, we'll go there. But the idea behind perseverance, I believe, is related to maturity. Some people would say, if you're saved, you're going to persevere. Okay? Now, I don't know if i got enough room to do this, but let me explain this. You have eternal life. Okay? At the moment, you believe the gospel. Right? Mm. And yeah, you can move the camera if you ever need to, mm. if you want. But, okay, you have eternal life at the moment you believe the gospel. Right? Now, after you get saved, you're still living a temporal life. Mm. You're still in time, you know. We live in a temporary world. 
Now this is important to understand because the moment you're saved, this becomes your position. Okay? And I explain this in various charts and stuff. That's who you are in Christ. That's your status. All right? Now this fluctuates because this is your experience. So after you get saved, no matter what happens in time, whether you reject Christ, right, or you live a life of sin, it cannot reverse what has happened in the eternal realm. Mm. Because you were given eternal life. You can't lose eternal life because of something that happens in time. Mm -hmm. doesn't make any sense. You know, it's like you're in a whole other dimension. Or beyond dimension, actually, when you're talking about eternal. And there's a lot of people that disagree with this statement. And that's because of their theology. Hmm. Historically, do you know anything about uh, uh, the Reformation? You ever learned about that in school? Might have, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> about 1500s, a uh, guy named Martin Luther. Hmm. Not Martin Luther King. He was <laughs> the one he's named after. Um, but Martin Luther nailed something called the 95 Thesis. Uh, on the on basically the church doors it said that there's 99 I mean 95 99 I'm thinking of the Jay-Z song uh, 99 problems but <laughs> but uh, uh, 95 things wrong with the Catholic Church or the abuses mm -hmm. and stuff and that started this whole cry for justification by faith he went and studied the languages and he uh, found out that the Bible was teaching justification by faith now this is what happens a lot of time when you're a pioneer, like the first one to take on a fight, first one to go into new lands and stuff, you're going to get some things right, but you're not going to get everything right, you know, because you're the one that's just breaking new territory, or at least it seemed like new territory because the church had fallen in such a dark age time, you know, even before the period of the dark ages. Well, what happened is this, is that... that he said justification is by faith alone. Okay? Faith alone. The Catholic Church says this. Wait, no, wait a minute. We got seven sacraments you got to do. And then you gain, once you, once you gain enough grace, then you're saved. Okay? And, and, and so they don't believe this idea that we receive Christ's righteousness at the moment of salvation. They believe in more of the idea of infused righteousness as more and more righteousness is added to your own account. But Bible tells us that our righteousness is filthy rags. So Luther was talking about faith alone, right? And the Catholics said, well, well that's going to lead to license. I don't know if I spelled that right, but that's supposed to be like license, like license you drive. Mm. In other words, if we let go, of the, if, if you teach what you're teaching, the people are going to do whatever they want. And you know what? Some of them did do that. When, when Martin Luther started teaching this, some of the kings that were underneath um, the authority of, of the, the Catholic Church, you know, they found freedom. They no longer had to be told what to do, you know. And so because of this, they started doing some crazy things. And a lot of the people couldn't read, you know, because the, the Bible was translated in Latin at that time and not in the, the language of the people. You know, Luther was German. And so because they did, were uneducated and all the other stuff and they just found out their freedom, some of them went buck wild. And so the Catholic Church said, look, look, see, that's why your stuff is false. Because it leads to license. And so, the, so, so Luther came back and he says uh, justification is by faith alone. But he basically says that faith is never alone. He says that it, that it shows by works or fruit. And you'll hear Christians all, all the time that even though they may not know about the history that I just talked about right there, they'll talk about, well, if you're saved, you're going to bear fruit. You're going to show results. You're going to serve the Lord. You're not going to reject Him. You're not going to live a life of sin. There's various forms of this, okay? But this came because he was studying certain passages of Scripture, and I believe he took certain ones out of context. Because, I mean, his focus was on about salvation. But some of the passages he used were not about salvation. Like, for example, there's many passages that you'll hear an evangelist use because they're so focused on saving people. But if you study those passages in context, you find out they're not necessarily about salvation. Like uh, Romans 6.23. Do you know that one? 
No, I don't. It was like the second one I learned after John 3.16 when I was little. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Sounds good, right? Sounds like it's saying, well, if I, if I uh, don't accept Christ as Savior, I'm going to be in death. Referring to hell, ultimately. Or, if I receive him, I receive his free gift of salvation. The problem with that is that a wage is something that's to earn. And when you study the context, it's not talking about how to be saved. It's talking about how to live after you're saved. Mm -hmm. So he's basically saying is that a believer who is not walking or persevering, if you want to use that term, he's going to be reaping the consequences of that lifestyle. It's basically, it comes down to this. If you're not in the Word every day, if you're not thinking like God, how else are you going to think? Hmm. You're going to think like the world, right? Most of our most of theology nowadays, uh, all theology is a study of, about God, okay? Um, basically, theos, I won't write it in Greek, but theos is God, right? Like an atheist is believes someone know God, hmm. but theos and logos means the word or study of something. So it's the study of God's word, basically. It's what, uh, and, and so what I'm saying is this, is that a lot of people get their theology from, from the movies, from music nowadays. I mean, you think of, uh, um, have you heard that Ariana Grande song, uh, God is a Woman? Or have you heard that one? Yeah. So you've already heard that idea, you know. And you've watched Marvel comic movies, you know, right? Yeah. So yeah. you've been exposed to gods and goddesses. Mm. You've probably heard about Eminem talking about rap god, right? Or MGK talking about rap devil. <laughs> so what I'm saying is this stuff is everywhere. Yeah. And whether you're watching uh, Riverdale on, on Netflix or if you're watching, uh, I think there's a new one out, Sabrina uh, it's like Sabrina the Teenage Witch, except more satanic type. But um, all I'm saying is that people learn, and, and it could be something more neutral. It could be just a regular sitcom, and they'll make a reference to the Bible and stuff. So people pick up uh, on the Bible about what they know about God from that stuff there. Because those same people that make those movies and, and that are involved in the media, they went to school once. Or if they didn't, they dropped out, and they at least read the right books and stuff. But my point is, is that the philosophies of, of all these other views and stuff get filtered in like that. And when you watch a movie, you're pretty much passive, right? I mean, most people don't like it when someone's talking about the movie. Well, what happens is it creates passive learning. And it cultivates, it cultivates uh, um, your thoughts and all of that. You know, I'm not being legalistic and saying, oh, you can't watch movies and all of that stuff. But what I am saying is this, is that Many people learn about God or the concepts of God or spirituality through uh, media, social media, you know, and all of that. So the reason I'm bringing all this up is because there are people who have these concepts in mind. They don't even know where they come from. They just, have, most Christian, most, actually, I'm going to say most Christians and most unbelievers have this idea that if you're a Christian, you need to live right or you're fake, Right? So, the problem with that is that whenever a baby comes into a world, can, what can it do for itself? Nothing. And what about a toddler? A little bit more, right? A little bit more. So as they mature, they can they can take on more responsibilities. Mm. They can function better. They can be better representatives of the family household and stuff like that. It's the same thing when you're saved. When you're born again, if you want to use that term, or when you believe in Christ. It's a point in time. Just like when a sperm touches an egg and it conceives a new life, you know? That's that. And just like how if, a, if, 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 you, if you die as a baby, are you still a human? Yeah. So even if you refuse to grow up and you die, are you still a human? Yeah. You think of the worst human that ever lived. If they die, are they still a human? Yeah. All right. In the same <laughs> way, whenever you're a Christian, you're a new creation. Mm. All right. And so whether you die in a state of immaturity or in a state of rebellion, you're still saved. You're still eternally secure. Now, you might die faster than other people because God can put you to sleep and using so many words. 
yeah. that the Bible teaches. So perseverance is good, but not for salvation. Mm. Okay. Um, I want to use the example of diatrib right here. Um, go to James uh, chapter 2, verse 18. I just want you to look at this. I want you to see how verse 18 begins and how verse 20 begins. So read 18 real quick out loud, please. Yes, to, towards yeah. the end. There it is. Yeah. What chapter? Two, verse 18. Just read like about the first four words. All right. But someone will say. But someone will say. Okay? Now read verse, Read the beginning of verse 20. All right. You foolish man. Okay, you're foolish man. The way diatrib works, I don't know if we can get this on the camera. Go ahead and slide it over if we need to. The way diatribe works is it'll say someone will say, okay? Then you get a quote by that person. And then you see, oh, foolish man, okay? So someone will say, then he gives the quote, and then the writer responds in this way. We do this all the time. You know how I did this a while ago with Martin Luther and the Catholics? And I responded back to what Martin Luther said? It's the same way. So when, when James says these words, someone say, he's, uh, I'm trying to use the term, um, we're just going to say he's, he's mentioning an imagined opponent, okay? So we'll just put opponent. And so when he says, oh foolish man, this is his response. But this is the thing. So that whole idea, 18 through 20, is one unit. Let's read it, and let's see what someone will say. Go ahead, start reading at 18. All right. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Okay, keep going. Then show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that, and shudder. All right, stop right there. Do you have quotation marks at the end of verse 18? Uh, not in this one. No. Not in this one? No, not mine. Okay, like in this Bible, this is the NASB. Mm. The quotation mark ends at verse 18. Okay. But if this concept of diatribe is correct, even that statement about you believe in one God, that's good, but even the devils believe and tremble, that's not James's words. Mm. That's his imagined opponent's words. But you will hear Christians all the time saying that faith in Christ alone is not enough because even the devils believe. All right? Now, the response to that is, number one, demons cannot be saved. Okay? And uh, so they're different than humans. And number two is that that's the idea of believing that God is one. That's monotheism. That's what Israel taught, the oneness of God. And, and it's true. Believing that God is one cannot save you, otherwise the Jews would be saved. Or the Muslims would be saved, even though their view of one is different um, than, than the Jewish view of one, or the biblical view of one. Okay? So this passage, I believe, was misunderstand, misunderstood by Martin Luther. And the Catholics definitely got it wrong right there. But, okay, read the rest of 20. All right. You foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? See, it says useless, right? Other translations say faith with, uh, other places say faith without works is dead. And people say, well, dead means you're not saved. No, dead means you're unproductive. Dead means you are useless. Remember, I'm saying the book, uh, the book is related to the idea of how to be useful for God. Mm. Okay? So, I gave you some of the historical aspect of what this means to endure to go through all this because it's the purpose of maturity. I've introduced the concept of diatribe. Now I want to tell you that, that scripture teaches that there's three enemies of the Christian. You know what they are? If you could guess. Well, non-believers? Huh? Non-believers? 
Well, no. we might feel like there are enemies. Not really. Though. Because the Bible says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Yeah. All right? So whenever we have conflicts with other people, really it's something more than that. But that concept of unbelief. You have three enemies. You have Satan, the world, and the flesh. And that's based off of 1 John, and it's also talked about in James right here as well. Mm -hmm. So Satan is trying to rule the world, right? He's trying to be God. He's not messing with us. You know, we got imps messing with us. Basically, most Christians fall to the world, the influence that we were talking about earlier through the movies and all of that stuff, uh, and their own desires, their own flesh, you know? Mm -hmm. So they probably have not even encountered the devil directly. You understand what I'm saying? Um, so there's two dangers in that. One, you think the devil uh, doesn't exist. And the other one, you, you're afraid of him and everything, you know? And so movies do that, especially around Halloween time. You know, you got the, you got the exorcist-type movies, you know, uh, where people are possessed. And then you got the priest that comes save the day, supposedly, you know? <laughs> but anyway... It, the work, both working on the same side. Not saying all, not saying every Catholic in the Catholic Church is evil. Mm. What I'm saying is the organization is because it's not biblical. Yeah. All right. They're saved people in the Catholic Church, not because of the Catholic Church, but in spite of it. And uh, um, so the three enemies that we have to watch out for. Okay. Now the plea of James is that we need to have joy. It starts very the beginning of the, of the book talking about count it all joy when you counter various trials because they produce perseverance and, and, and uh, basically allows you to mature. The things that you go through and mature. For example, the pressure that you've been under recently yeah. has brought you here to class today. You know? You're grateful for what you have right now, right? Yeah. You have a job. You have a house. You have your mother. You have an opportunity right now. Yeah. You know? Um, you're being useful, you know, you're, you're using the camera, you know, and you're, you're also supporting, uh, this ministry and stuff. So that's good. Just have confidence in him because basically what it was saying is this, if you're going through something, ask God for wisdom, but don't doubt. Otherwise you're going to mm -hmm. be unstable in all your ways. You're going to be scattered brain, you yeah. know, you're going to be, um, the word, uh, is where we get the word schizophrenic from. The divided mind, basically, split mind, split focus. And so the other aspect is just keep your focus on Christ. Now, I want to show you something. Go to the book of Hebrews, which is right before James. And you may have never heard this, but I want to share it with you just very briefly. Okay, James, I mean, not James, sorry. Uh, Hebrews 12, start reading at uh, 12, 1, uh, let's see, 12, 1 through 3. All right. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything, <clears throat> everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance and race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy of set before him endured the cross, scorning his shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Okay, so we have the concept of endurance, right? Perseverance. Mm -hmm. And it talks about we're surrounded by such cloud of witnesses. The chapter right before that, it's called the Heroes of Faith chapter, what some people call it, or the Hall of Faith. Um, it describes a lot of Old Testament Christian, I mean not Christian, saints, believers of the Old Testament that did a lot of things through faith. Some of them were victorious. Well, they were all victorious in, in some sense. But some lived on, you know, in the great exploits. Or some even died. Like one was sawed in half. Mm. You don't want to do that one by faith. But if you have <laughs> to do it, you better do it by faith. Um, that's pretty tough. Um, and I'm not talking about no magician trick, you know. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, okay. The, the idea I want to focus on is this. Let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. Okay? Now, many Christians think that Christianity is just about stop sinning. All right? 
or sinning less. Notice this. You got to lay things aside. And what are you laying aside according to that passage? No. Uh, it's, it should be in verse 1. Verse 1. After the word lay aside. Where's that? Hebrews 12, 1. Yeah, that's one. Is it? Right after the cloud of witness thing. Oh, throw off everything that hinders it. Okay. Everything that hinders. And what does uh, it say after that? And the sins that so easily entangle us. And the okay. sins that easily entangle us. Many Christians think that it's all about stop sinning. Hmm. But that's not what this is saying. This is saying that sin hinders us or, or entangles us or trips us up. But what but our but Christian Christianity is not about stop sinning. It's about running the race. Okay? And it gives an example of someone who ran the race, Jesus Christ, and everything that he endured on the cross for us as a motivation for us to go forward. So that's very important that we understand because we got to keep our focus. Mm. We keep our focus on him and what he went through. And what his word went through. Um, which, well, now we're going to get into our passage real quick. Let's see, yep. Okay, go back to Hebrews. I mean, not Hebrews. Uh, James. And we're going to start reading at verse uh, 19. All right. What? My dear brothers, take note of this, everyone. Should be quick to listen. Slow to speak and slow to become angry. Okay, stop right there. When it says everyone should be quick to hear, this is the concept uh, in, in Hebrew, it's called the Shema. You, you've heard the Muslims, you know, that statement they make where they raise their finger and they say, La ilaha ilaha Muhammad Rasulullah. Mm -hmm. Basically, they're saying that they bear witness that God is one and Muhammad is their messenger. They kind of rip that off from the Jews because if you go to, go to Deuteronomy chapter 6, of course, they're not going to say about Muhammad, but um, in in uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. In in Deuteronomy six four, you have the Shema. Um, in fact, start at verse three. Okay. Uh, Hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey to that if I obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord of our God, the Lord is one. Okay, hear that? The Lord is our God, the Lord is one. That's the Shema. Mm -hmm. That's the statement that the Jews make, you know, that, that, that God is one, okay? And, and, and compare it into all the polytheistic religions, you know, that have many gods, God is one. So whenever James says, and you got to keep in mind, he's writing to the scattered tribes. He's writing to Jewish Christians. I didn't mention this in this lesson, but James was the first New Testament book written. Okay? So he's writing to a Jewish Christian audience. And, um, you know, he's when he says... Uh, uh, quick to listen, this is that idea. Not just listen, but listen with the intent to obey. Mm. All right? Because then if you keep reading this passage, you don't have to do it. But it, it basically says that you need to teach God's word to your children where they go in, where they lay out. In, in other words, every opportunity you get, you should be sharing the word with them because it creates a worldview which helps them make their decisions to be effective members of society, you know, representatives for God. Okay, so now... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to another passage in the Old Testament. Uh, go to Exodus. I'll show you another thing. The, uh, I believe the Muslims ripped off from uh, uh, the Bible. Uh, Exodus 30. Let me see if I can find it. I may, I may just have to tell you where it is. Okay. Because I may not be able to find it. 
The Muslims say this statement, in the name of Allah, most gracious and most merciful. They say that all the time. Well, God, reveal, God reveals himself when he gives the commandments and other things that he does. And he says that he's, he's uh, uh, slow to anger, compassionate, and all of that. Well, in Hebrew, the, the idiom, uh, you know what idiom is? Like if I say heads up, what's that yeah. mean? Oh, like to catch something or something like that. Yeah, Don't heads up, pay yeah. attention. Let me give you the heads up. Yeah. Let me keep you up to date. But that's an idiom because mm -hmm. a head up, you got to understand, oh, you mean raise my head, but raise my head for what? Yeah. You got to have context to understand that. So an idiom is like a figure of speech that has kind of lost its uh, origin. At least we know with heads up, kind of an idea where it comes from, you know, and it can be researched. Well, the word for slow to anger that's in James, in, in Hebrew, the word is long of nose. That's what it means, long of nose. So God is pictured as one having a long of nose. Now, this is not saying God is like Pinocchio or anything, <laughs> but basically what it's saying is like, uh, I'm going to use some other imagery. You know, when you, when you, you ever watch cartoons or whatever, when you see someone's nostrils and the smoke's coming out, you know, yeah. and it's flaring, you know. And so the idea of long of nose means that God is pa patient. He's enduring, if you will, mm -hmm. with his people. And so when, what James is basically saying is, I want to remind you Jewish Christians what God told you. That you need to be uh, quick to hear the word of God and do it. You need to be slow to anger, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, and, and uh, uh, slow to speak. Because that relates to the idea of being wise. All right? Now, the Bible says be angry, but do not sin. You understand that? Mm -hmm. So sinning, I mean, anger is not a sin in itself. But it can turn to sin. Okay? So let's go back to James. So it's important that whenever you study the Bible that you immerse yourself in the Bible world. Um, because we're not Jewish Christians, right? Mm. We don't know we don't understand everything that's going on. You know, through careful study, you know, we can we can bridge some of those gaps. But uh um it's just important for us to understand that there's things in here that that a lot of people jump to, you know. And, and don't understand what is actually being said. All right, so. Okay, now watch, watch what verse 20 says. James uh, 1, verse 20. No, there. Right. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous, righteous, no, not righteousness. Rightness. Yeah, righteousness. Oh, okay, righteousness life that God desires, therefore get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Okay, now, um, so it's explaining why you should be so to anger. Because uh, uh, anger does not reveal the will of God, basically. Now, Jesus Christ got angry, right? Mm. But he didn't sin. He drove out the temple. Uh, the, the money changers out the temple and stuff. But he didn't have a sin nature, okay? And he was God in the flesh. We have a sin nature, and we're not God in our flesh, you know? So usually when we try to express anger, we don't do it in the right way, or we don't do it in a righteous way. Um, notice that just like the Hebrew passage, you're putting aside certain sins, right? And, and, you're, and you're putting something on. You're supposed to receive the word of God that's implanted. Mm. Okay, now let me show you something. Read verse 18. He, ch he chooses to give give us birth through the word of truth and that he might be, be a kind of first fruits of all that he created. Okay, now it's basically saying he chose to give us birth, right? Mm -hmm. So they're already born. That's that dot, okay? So it said you're born by the word of God, by believing the word of God, right? And, and the idea of first fruits is the first of your crops. You're basically saying, God, thank you for what you've given me. This is what, he, what the Jewish Christians, thank you what you've given me, and now I'm going to give you, you know, the first of that. Mm -hmm. It was the whole tithing system, which was for the Jews, um, not for the church. So you have, you have that going on there. 
But that passage you just read in 21 said, Receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. So James tells you that you were saved. You were brought, you were brought forth, right? So let's make a division here. This is the position side. This is our experience side. And this is the ultimate category when we get a glorified body. Mm. So he said, you, you've been brought forth by the word of God here. But in your experience, you need to receive that same word. Because it's able to save your soul. And we got a problem. Because how many times have you ever heard somebody say, they sold their soul to the devil? Or, we need to save souls. You'll hear Christians even say that. Mm. They're already saved. This is not talking about hell. Mm. This is talking about the word soul is suke, where we get, you know, word psychology comes from. This relates to the, the life um, that we live. In this experience, you know, so it's the quality of life that we have. It, it could relate to psychological well-being. It could relate to those things like that. In fact, look at the end of James and start at verse 19, 519. Okay. My brother's... My brothers, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring him back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Okay, that word him right there, mm. they didn't translate the word soul, but the word soul is there. Like in the NASB, it's there. And because they're saying they're saying that it refers to him. Now, this, this is one of those passages I was telling you earlier that when evangelists learn it, they go sharing it. Like, if I go evangelize and save people, it's going to cover a multitude of sins. Maybe my sins, maybe your sins, you know. That's how they use it. But this is talking about you being underneath danger mm. of losing your physical life because the Lord can discipline you. Because in the context, he's also talking about people that are sick, you know, um, because God is disciplining them in this passage. That's a whole other issue. But I just want you to understand that context will help. And so when you see words like saved, delivered, you should ask delivered from what? Are we talking about hell? Are we talking about something in the temporal life? Or are we talking about a glorif getting a glorified body? Okay? All right, so back to James 1. So now that we understand the book is about how to be useful to God, and it's not talking about how to be safe from hell, mm. Read verse 22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the per, uh, perfect law and gives freedom and continues to do this and not forgetting what he has heard but doing it he will be blessed in what he does if anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue he deceives himself and his religion is worthless religion that god our father accepts as pure and faultless is this to look at after orphans and widows and their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world okay lot there but so basically what he's saying is this is that whenever you don't do what the word of God says mm. you can fall into self-deception and when a person is deceived by themselves they think they're closer to God than they really are so they start acting self-righteous and holy and and they don't know what God's going on and it makes a comparison of someone who went and looked in the mirror and but the mirrors that they had back then are not like the ones we have now they, I mean they're more like metal you can hardly see a reflection in, you know, it's murky. Um, and there's a difference between this looking and then the one that's uh, mentioned in uh, 25, the one who looks intently, okay? Many people look at the Bible like they're looking in that type of mirror. But they don't look intently, all right? They're not careful when they study the Bible. They think, oh, that don't matter. I'm just, I just want to know how this Bible passage is going to... Help me get through the rest of the week. The problem with that is you actually are studying in selfishly. And a person who's looking to the Bible for themselves only, I'm not saying there's not a benefit for ourselves, but a person who only wants to feel good about themselves, 
to find out what's going on in their life and all of that stuff, that is a person who falls into self-deception. And that's why you have the prosperity gospel where these people are teaching, you know, God's going to bless you and, you know, and all this type of stuff. You send me money and, and they're looking and they don't ever talk about the bad news. So a person only listening to that don't hear about how God disciplines his people, how God makes them persevere through trials and things. So mm -hmm. understand that idea right there. And then he talks about keeping watching your tongue. You know, because what's in your heart is going to come out of your tongue. That's the mm -hmm. idea there. And and the the thing is, is that these people are of no use. They're worthless, as it says right there. But we want to be useful to God. And it mentions this, pure and undefiled religion is this, given to widows and orphans. That idea of helping the helpless, right? Um, but I want to mention some concerns. So this, this idea, let me say this real quick, that statement... Uh, quick to hear, slow to speak, uh, wait, yeah, and slow to anger. Some people believe that that's like the, the, the summary of the divisions of the book of James. Mm. Okay? Because that's listening about we need to hear the word of God and obey it. We need to do what it says, and we need to show love and compassion. And that's what this section about the widows and orphans deals with right here. Um, but this is the thing. There are some Christians... And I know through online ministry who have orphanages, who have, uh, they're taking care of widows and things like that. And that's what they spend all their money on. That's what they spend all their resources on. So rather than, rather than uh, taking that money and buying books to train ministers, you know, mm. to teach them the word of God. They spend it on these orphans and these widows and all that to bring in HIV patients and, and stuff like that. Now, a lot, some of these people are ignorant. They don't know. They think I'm being obedient to this word. They don't recognize that this was the first uh, New Testament book written. And so God has revealed more in addition to that. I'm not saying this is irrelevant, but it needs to be clarified, you know, because mm. we're not Jewish Christians. Um. But go to 1 Timothy 5. Many people, many people use this passage talking about true widows and orphans. And then if you don't take care of their if you don't take care of their needs or their situation, they blow you off and say you're a hypocrite. But actually, this isn't all what scripture says. Paul writing and explaining how, what the church should do about honoring widows says a lot to say about widows. Okay? And according to what this says right here, not all widows are supposed to get help in the church. So let's read this real quick. Start at uh, 1 Timothy 5, 1. Go forward. 5, 1? Mm -hmm. All right. Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as he, if he were your father. Treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters with absolute, absolute purity. Give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need. Really but, in need. You hear that? Mm -hmm. Now keep going. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, these should learn first of all to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family and so repaying their parents and grandparents. For this is in pleasing to God. So if you're, if you're a widow... Right? Mm -hmm. And you have children or grandchildren. It's saying your responsibility is to take care of those in your home. Mm -hmm. Rather than to go to the church and say, hey, we need help. Give me a check. You know? Yeah. Because some, some churches, you know, they get, they rather get money out than actually teach the word of God. All right? Keep going. The widow who is really in need and left all alone puts their, her hope in God and continues night and day to pay, pray and to ask, for God, ask God for help. But the widow who lives for pleasure and is dead even while she lives. You hear that? Mm -hmm. This is this is saying, look, if you're, we're not talking about helping the widows of the world. We're not talking about helping the drug addicts. You mm -hmm. know, we're not talking about uh, uh, helping those people that won't help themselves or at least allow other people. There's some people that that come to church only to get things. Well, actually, some of them don't even come to church. They'll mm -hmm. come up here on the weekdays or whatever. And want gas vouchers and all this other stuff. And they got a whole route that they go around hustling people from different churches and stuff. Mm. 
And uh, um, there's there's times we help them and all that. That's not the point. But they, they don't want to have a relationship with the church. They just want what the church gives them. But they 